Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's last Technorama Tuesdays webinar of 2020. Uh, I hope you're all well and gearing up for the holiday season. My name's Hannah Murray, and I'm the Student Services and Compliance Officer here at the CMTO. I'm also on the board of Technorama, and I'll be on hand to assist with any of your technical queries, questions, and things you'd like to ask during the webinar. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. Tonight, we are talking about small board computing basics with our wonderful guest speaker for this evening, Steph Piper from Elkie Education in Toowoomba. We are also joined by Evan Wyatt, who is a freelance tech in remote areas and Terry O'Connor from 4OUR in Caboolture. At the end of Steph's session, we will have a discussion panel and uh, we'll all get together and talk about our projects and things that we're doing with Raspberry Pi and Arduino. I'm going to very quickly hand over to our uh, Capitan John Mazels, our president of Technorama, uh, for your latest and greatest Technorama updates. So John, over to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. I, I know, El Capitan, it just sounds so politically wrong. However, um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. And look, this is just absolutely wonderful. One of the things that we really want to engender through Technorama is getting back to that pioneering spirit in the days when we actually built everything. So uh, when I was a boy, um, you know, we had to build everything because you couldn't go and buy this stuff. And it just pains me that a lot of the ability to go and, and build your own equipment has in fact vanished because not only don't you have that pride of, of building stuff and saying, I did that, but you're, you know, we're also not providing opportunities for people to develop problem determination and fixing and repair skills that are really vital. So this series of discussions that we're, we're kicking off tonight is about how you can go and get your hands dirty and build useful things and have a lot of fun at the same time. And I discovered when I put my hands into my own cupboard that I had three Raspberry Pis and three Arduinos and a whole heap of kits and maybe some of that will come out in show and tell a little later, but this is very exciting for me. Uh, for Technorama, we've got our annual general meeting coming up. So that's gonna be in uh, two weeks today on the 22nd. And those of you who are members should receive uh, the annual general meeting packet in the next 12 hours. It'll be just on, on the cusp of time. Uh, we'll be opening, the, um, opening for uh, nominations for the committee. So we have two uh, positions, uh, two executive positions and two committee members um, up for election this year. And we love some nominations from people who you know, are from unusual locations and not in Sydney or not, well, we're distributed anyway. So uh, I don't think we have to say we're all in the same place. We're not. Um, we're certainly looking for people who want to get involved. I will say that one of the biggest things you can do with your life is get involved. Find your professional association, whatever it is, you know, if, if that's how you feel about Technorama, and get involved. And it's when you actively get involved in helping to make things happen that the real switch gets turned and you start making contacts and doing things that can literally be life-changing. And I've seen that happen in my own life a number of times when I've got involved uh, with groups such as this. So uh, that's about it. We're going to be coming back uh, in the new year with extensions to the series that we're starting here. We're also after your ideas. So drop a line. If you can't think of anywhere else to send it, like john at technorama.org.au, if you just send to info at technorama.org.au, that will get to a number of us. If you've got an idea for a webinar, if there's some topic that you'd really like to see, dealt with uh, or teased out, do that. Um, tell your friends about Technorama Q&A, the Facebook group. Uh, it's just a fabulous place to uh, go and discuss interesting and related things and get questions answered. Um, we're, we're having a great time with it. And just in case, a number of people uh, pinged me today to say they weren't sure about this session and whether it was really only for members of Technorama. Technorama Tuesdays is for everybody and not even just in community radio. It's for everybody who has any interest in the topic. It's by getting involved and going, oh, I could play in that sandbox that you make that next step. 
um, and that we get new blood into the sector and we always need new blood into the sector. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Hannah and looking forward to, uh, to hearing what, what Steph, who I met over the weekend, um, is going to be uh, handing to us. And we'll all be back for the panel a little later. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, John. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Steph Piper from Elkey Education in Toowoomba. If Steph could come to the stage, to the screen. There we go. Hi, Steph. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, thanks for joining us this evening. I will uh, hand over to you now. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, super excited to be here and have a chat to you all about uh, Raspberry Pi and Arduino. So this session is designed to give you guys enough knowledge to sort of know what to use for a particular project and know how to get started uh, with these two boards. Uh, but for now, I'm interested in, uh, if you guys can put in the chat, what's got you, you know, what's got you interested in Arduino or Raspberry Pi? And if there's anything in particular project wise that you're looking at doing or that you are looking to learn tonight, um, I'd be very keen to have a quick read of those to make sure that I can sort of make sure that I cover uh, any questions that you might have. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, my name's Steph Piper anyway, and uh, I'll sort of quickly go into a little bit of an about section um, so you can sort of know a bit more background about me. Um, so during the day, I work out at the University of Southern Queensland in the library makerspace. And so the makerspace is a place where you can go and do hands-on type projects. Uh, we've got stuff there for 3D printing, 3D scanning, uh, electronics, all kinds of great stuff. Uh, so if you're a university student or you're, you know, coming by Toowoomba just for a visit, you're very welcome to call in and have a bit of a look around, just like uh, John did yesterday uh, for a bit of a look. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I also uh, have a bit of a side hustle as well called Elky Education, which is a company making electronics kits for young girls. Um, so I'll quickly put a link in the chat to that one so you can check it out. But essentially, um, I've been working hard to design custom circuit boards um, for soldering kits in this space. So you can see a couple of the pictures on the screen there of my latest kit that I've designed, which is a snap out cat design here. So the idea is that you can snap out the pieces and you can assemble a three-dimensional soldering kit uh, that lights up when it gets dark. And some of my other soldering kits are just here. And these ones here are a bit special because they have different solder mask colors. So normally when you see circuit boards, you think about circuit boards, um, especially with Raspberry Pis, obviously, you think of something that's in you know, the bright green type colors. And so my circuit boards that I've designed uh, we've been able to sort of hack the manufacturing process a little bit and we've been able to generate a bit of a unique aesthetic that's a bit more sort of fun and pops um, for making stuff like, uh, you know, soldered badges to help get our next generation excited about what's possible in the electronic space and making something that, you know, isn't just sort of, you know, a bit of, bit of fun along the way, but is also something that looks fantastic at the end stage and is something that they're proud to have on display and show off. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I do like the idea of the old uh, Dick Smith kits. Um, yeah, I think that's eventually where we'd like to go with this kind of stuff. Um, this, uh, this is another new kit here that I'm sort of working on. This one's going to be a spaceship design, which has tilt switches all over it so that when you're flying it around with your hand, as you of course need to do when you've got a tiny spaceship in your hand, meow, uh, it'll have tilt switches all over it so that when it, when it moves, different LEDs will turn on, uh, making it look like it's course correcting. Um, so this kind of stuff is pretty exciting to me anyway. And we recently just got our kits picked up by Pimeroni, which is the largest European stockist of this kind of stuff. So we're slowly growing and yeah, it's a, it's a very, very exciting process. And that's right. Pew, pew. Yes, cool. So I did put in the link. Um, there it is, awesome. Uh, but yeah, also um, outside of my work as well, I used to be pretty involved with the Brisbane hacker space. So it's a bit of a, a big anarchy version of my day job and it is the largest hacker space in Australia. Uh, so if you find yourself down in Brisbane or you live around Brisbane, definitely recommend that you go and have a bit of a look uh, and check out the Tuesday open nights at the Brisbane hacker space. So um, there's stuff in there for 3D printing, laser cutting, electronics, woodworking, metalworking, welding, blacksmithing, and automotive. And the, uh, I think one of the, the ham radio clubs also meets there on a, on a Monday night. One of my favourite things that they introduced when I was president there was um, the 24-hour swipe card access system. And we'd set it up in such a way that you can actually 
um, you know, like when you swipe in through the door, you can set your own theme song to play, which plays um, on every phone in every room. Um, so it really was a, a journey of self-discovery to, to work out what your theme song was. Um, I haven't quite made myself full screen because um, I'm going to keep going on pretty quick uh, with lots of big pictures on the slides. Um, but yeah, let's let's move on anyway. So um, if you do have sort of uh, anything you would like to learn about Arduino or Raspberry Pi tonight, please make sure you put that in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that as I'm talking. Um, and if there's anything, you know, uh, project-wise that you're looking at building as well. Anyway, let's jump in and get started. So, okay, let's get going. So we'll talk about Raspberry Pi first. So Pi's essentially are a microprocessor or a miniature computer, which means that it's got all the stuff in there for you to get started with like booting up a computer, writing software and doing projects that rely on a lot of heavy processing and brain power, I suppose. It runs on a, a Linux distribution called Raspbian or News, so a very light version of an operating system. And what makes it cool compared to a standard computer is it's so much cheaper and you have GPIO, GPIO pins that connect the computer to the real world. So you can start to look at building things that connect to the computer um, a lot easier, stuff like sensors and inputs and outputs, where this computer can be thinking and doing things you know, that are, that are sort of quite powerful impacts on a little invention that you're trying to build. Um, so it's a very popular um, platform. And essentially this is sort of how it works here. You've got like all the things a normal computer would have, including your CPU, your RAM, you've got uh, an ethernet port as well, if you wanna hardwire your internet in, but it's also got a Wi-Fi chip and it can just, you know, get Wi-Fi as well, no problem. Uh, it runs the operating system through a micro SD card, which sits in the slot underneath the board, which we can't see in this picture. And generally you would also plug in a keyboard and a mouse in the USB slots here. And you would also, you know, plug in a screen with the um, micro HDMI port here as well. So uh, it operates pretty much like a full computer where you need to have all those extra peripherals plugged in to get started with it, essentially. Uh, it's also got some extra features on here as well, like um, a camera port ribbon cable plug-in area. So you can start to plug in extras like cameras. And all of these GPIO pins at the top here, that's the area that you can start to plug in uh, anything that's going to make your invention come to life. Um, so it's, it's a lot packed into a very tiny board. Um, looking at the types of Pi now as well, there's a few different types. Uh, the first one, like or one of the sort of the first few that has come out was the Pi Model A, so it's a little bit older now. Uh, the latest sort of more heavy version is the Pi Model B. I know there's a few iterations of both of these um, and a few improvements that have different things, but I sort of haven't gone into too much detail around the actual iterations themselves. These are just the, like the base model sort of designs. You've also got the amazing Pi Zero, which is meant to be the the $10 computer. So it's an even smaller of a form factor. And this ultra tiny board is about this big, super cheap, and yeah, it can do some pretty cool projects, but obviously won't have as much processing power as the bigger Pi Model B. So if you are looking at getting started, probably the Pi Model B is one of the best places to start, but you've also got the brand new Pi 400 that's just come out. And it's uh, just hit the stores in the last sort of few weeks. And essentially it's a Pi that has been stretched out and fits inside a keyboard, which means that if you wanna do projects that are going to be um, you know, more conducive to you know, teaching or needing that keyboard there to make it easier for your project to function, um, this is a pretty great option. So I'm really keen to get a set of these um, as a class set potentially uh, to make it a lot easier for people to get into Raspberry Pi. But of course, if you have a project that you know, um, needs a smaller area to actually fit in, uh, you probably don't want a keyboard around the outside. But there's a few pretty great options here. And if you want to go ahead and uh, you know, start doing some um, shopping around, the two sort of best electronics online stores that I would recommend for Australian shipping are Core Electronics and Little Bird Electronics. Um, so they're the two best ones out there. As well as these boards, you can also get quite a lot of hats that fit on top of these boards that fit directly 
into those DPIO pins. And these will, you know, enhance the functionality uh, with a preset number of things, uh, which can make it a bit easier to start doing your inventing and prototyping if someone's already made a base for what you're trying to build. Some of the classic examples are, of course, um, uh, this one here, which I was sort of looking at buying this week, to be honest. It's called the Enviro Plus. Um, and this one here, we'll have a quick look at the video, essentially has environmental monitoring all over it. So uh, right now it is like in this video, it's taking a live sample of the air quality around it. And living on a busy road, I was sort of interested in the idea of just having this next to the window and realistically seeing how much, uh, you know, crappy air that I might be breathing in. Um, so this board here is anyway 99 bucks to get started. Um, let's see if we can uh, back out of this one. Okay, but yeah, you can also get stuff like uh, GPS hats, uh, hats for doing TV streaming, you know, for getting in like a, like a, a TV signal, um, LED matrix stuff. Like, yeah, it really is a lot of stuff out there for getting started with these projects. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel at all. You can go and find projects people have already started and built a full, you know, structure for. That's going to save you a lot of time and uh, energy in putting something that you want together. Oop, moving on. So we're looking at a bit of a, can we get a price check on aisle three, please? Uh, so this is Core Electronics current pricing for uh, the, the different pies that they've got available. So you can see that the Pi Zero is pretty damn cheap. So this is probably a really good place to start for smaller projects, uh, if you're just wanting to have a go but not spend too much money. Uh, when you start to you know, look at the Pi Model Bs though, uh, depending on how much space you want, uh, you can see the price going up. So if you want a, a two gigabyte Pi Model B, you're looking at around 66 bucks, 92 for a four gigabyte, or if you want the, uh, the big one, you can pay 123 bucks for eight gigs of storage. Um, and I think most projects, like depending on what you want to do, wouldn't really use that much gigage, I would assume. So uh, I think, you know, something, you know, small is probably a good place to start. But if you want to, you know, look at the different example projects, some of them will, of course, require uh, higher amounts of gigage. Uh, so these are some of my, um, yes, thanks, Evan. Uh, Element 14 is also a pretty good supplier. Um, a uh, question from Harry, are they able to set up to control multiple camera security video streams and able to record motion and view in real time, perhaps record to a HDD? That is a great question. I would have to Google that to give you a good answer to that one. But um, I know that the, the, the Pi camera that is meant to plug in with that ribbon cable is not really that good of a quality. Um, but of course, you can just plug in cameras through USB. So you should be able to do something like that. Um, pretty straightforward. I think that would be very possible and within the scope of what a Raspberry Pi can do. Um, yeah, these are some of the uh, great example projects that we've got. Uh, some of these are my absolute favourites. So I have always wanted to build a magic mirror, which is where you pretty much get an old TV or an old screen and you put it behind a two-way mirror and you can essentially have a Raspberry Pi controlling a custom heads-up display in here showing whatever you would like to potentially show um, into, you know, including what the, the local weather is, whether the traffic's bad on the way to work, you know, all that sort of key information that you might want to look at and have a, you know, have a quick squeeze at before you walk out the door. There's also some, some pretty great um, Pycade projects as well, where you can look at doing retro gaming consoles, um, you know, not just heads up ones like this, but also portable ones as well. Um, lots and lots of stuff. A lot of the projects um, that people tend to do as well are also in the server space. So um, you can be setting up a Plex server on a Raspberry Pi. So for those who don't know, if you have a large collection of um, uh, you know, movies on your hard drive that you want to make available to everyone else in your family through a Netflix style format, Plex server is a great way to set that up where you can actually have everything on that hard drive accessible to anyone else who would like to watch it that you control. And so rather than sort of, you know, uh, shutting down your computer and sort of being worried that, oh, what if someone tries to access my Plex server, you can just have it running on a Raspberry Pi. But of course, you know, doing something like this requires the higher level of Raspberry Pi gigage that you need. You might also want to set up some kind of a gaming server as well for playing stuff like Minecraft 
or Arc Survival Evolved or anything that you know you control your own custom server for. You might also want to do some kind of a mining project, probably not Bitcoin, but maybe some of the newer ones. Um, and yeah, run your own home assistance, all kinds of great stuff uh, with these ones. So I might quickly um, let Terry or Evan have a bit of a chat and talk about some of their example Raspberry Pi projects. If one of them is listening and wants to switch on, there we go, we got Terry. Uh, so I'll quickly head over to Terry and um, let him explain some of his cool projects. Just um, a project that I came up, well, I didn't come up with it, I found, found the scripting on the internet. Um, it's called the PERS clock and it's a radio, it's a studio clock for a radio station. One of the great things about Raspberry Pi is that um, it synchronizes um, its time base to a Stratum uh, 1 or Stratum 2 time server um, when you boot it on the internet. And um, if I can reach over here, um, you can also trigger um, microphone on off on off lights and what have you um, by pulling the GPIO pins high and low um, as you uh, and any other um, uh, warning indicator lights that you might want say carrier fail in a community radio station or or a door alarm to say there's someone at the front door that uh, needs to be let in for the next shift. Steph. Oh, cool thanks Terry. Uh, how about you Evan? Uh, you had a few example projects as well. Just getting my sub organized. Um, yeah, look, over the years, it's an interesting one with um, Raspberry Pi. It's sort of, um, I've, I've done a few projects and the sort of things that you've got to be a little bit innovative. When you're out in the bush in your remote areas, um, you've got to use what you can use out there. You know, you can't have all this flash, nice equipment on that. So you, you look, at, you scale it down a bit and I look, always look at the Raspberry Pi and say, yeah, I can do that. That can do with the Raspberry Pi. It's cheap, simple, carry it with me in the bag, you know, because you're traveling light. And I found a lot of solutions. And one particular one, I've got a few here, but one about two or three years ago, I was in remote communities in the Northern Territory. And um, they wanted a public address system for the community. They just love their PA. And to get disseminate information into the community, the Aboriginal communities there. And they, they you know, they said, well, we, we put a speaker here, yet right, mob right down the camp down the bottom, they can't hear. How are we going to get down there? And I thought, hmm, good, good question. So what I did with one particular um, setup is I streamed two Raspberry Pis. So had one at the PA, where it came out PA, it was the local PA, and then streamed it with a point-to-point -point data link. <laughs> it's got quite technical. They are more expensive than the Pi, the whole link. And um, Pi down the other end, audio out, fed into a PA, and there we go. And so I could, I tested it once and I got with this link, something like about uh, 10 kilometers to stream that same audio into another part of a community. So, you know, there's the other sort of applications you can put them to, cheap, simple. You don't want a big desktop computer sitting there just streaming audio, hello, you know, heat, uh, the power, the cost, we're a Raspberry Pi, and especially the four you were talking about. I mean, they've got a lot of grunt now, you know. I mean, they've got eight gigabit of RAM. You know, they're the $90 Pi. Fantastic. Also, um, I've used them, and I use them all the time for development work, what I'm doing. Every time I come up with an idea, right, the Pi comes out, and all the bits and pieces come out, and I develop everything on the Pi. It's just so flexible. Um, web page, um, audio streaming. Um, you know, I, I use Apache a lot uh, as a web page for a Pi for a project. And also, like you had there before, that screen, you know, the information screen you were talking about. Um, so what I've created is the, the kiosk. And I think that could be very useful for radio stations in that way. You can have an old computer screen and just have it on a wall, have a Raspberry Pi driving it. And it, when you boot it up, it just boots up into Chromium which is the Raspberry Pi version of Google Chrome, as we know, and it just boots up and there's your whole screen. And you can just have it scrolling. Signage, I've done that. And just use it as a simple signage device. And um, you could also use it for information in a radio station too. You might have it sitting at the front office and it, it can just, people can swipe it with their 
touchscreen, the Raspberry Pi touchscreen for information or the what's the schedule or what's happening in my radio station. So, you know, you just keep thinking of all these crazy ideas. Yes, I can do that on a Pi. <laughs> yeah. So, and I've worked on, and that one I'm going to hopefully present sometime next year, which I'll get around to it is um, developing a streaming netboard. And what prompted that was, this project was the lockdown. So everybody's trying to operate remotely. I thought, ah, here's another solution. Why don't we just put pies in everybody's house and they can stream back to the studio. Problem solved, you know, everyone can afford it. They can buy their own. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so, and that project came out of that and I took it a few steps further and I packaged it all up so it looked, looked professional. And um, actually it's up, up in the Torres Strait at the moment running for, we call them RIBS, Remote Indigenous Broadcast Service. You've probably heard of those or Brax radio stations. Every Aboriginal community there has its own radio station, FM radio. And to stream those, get those back to the studio, I thought this has got to be a great way of doing it. You know, fantastic. And so I built these little boxes and that's where we were talking about your um, beautiful um, 3D printer just sitting to your left. <laughs> I love to have had it because I wanted to build the boxes specifically for this project. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So I built the boxes, put them all out there and just, you know, streamed it over satellite and it just worked. It was just quite amazing. It sort of blew me away. I thought, wow, I'm looking for all the problems, you know, but nothing's cropped up yet. But touch wood. And um, so that way I've got now four studios and they're all just got little Raspberry Pis sitting out there and all they're doing is just taking the signal out of the studio into the Raspberry Pi and it's constantly streaming 24 seven. So the hub studio can then just, and I developed a touch screen using, developed a web page on a touch screen and the hub studio can just sit there and go, oh, I want to listen to that station. They just go, Doop, bang, fade it up, it's on air. No, all they do at each end is just push the on button at the remote studio and forget about it. It does everything itself. And at the studio end, they just push the on button, fade it up. It was a great concept and it worked, you know. I thought, wow, this is great. This is what you do on lockdown. <laughs> Nothing else to do. Keep yourself amused. Yeah. So they're the sort of projects I... What a great set of projects. Oh, wait, you've actually muted yourself. There you go. <laughs> How did I manage there that? And um, one other project, just the final one, was an interesting one. It's probably not related to radio, but it could be. And I was thinking about today is um, RFI, the RFID. So as we know, the little card that just swipe on a door and it automatically opens for you. So I built one of those using an Arduino, as a matter of fact. I think it was, yeah, I had the Arduino. I sort of shifted off the pie and went to the Arduino for some reason anyway. But it was a project that came from somebody who approached me outside radio and said, we have all these people and we're trying to keep a track of these people coming and going through this particular point, tourists we're talking about. And I thought, well, yeah, okay, why don't we do something like that? So there you go, you know. And I think you could use that application for the radio station, people coming and going in radio stations, people signing on, going to transmitter sites, whatever, authorised people. And then you can keep a log of those people who come and go. So. That's another use for it. That's, that's quite a handy one. That's so you issue all the staff with a little swipe card, which you, where do you get those from? JK or somewhere? You buy them around anyway. Yeah, and yeah. they just walk Thank up you. to the door. And if they're authorised, door opens, go in, do their air shift. Go out, swipe the card, log in, log off. Yeah, right. good application. Thanks so much, Evan. I'll jump back in. I'll stop I'll... there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it though. What a great set of um, real world projects. Um, absolutely fantastic. So, what happens though if you wanna if you wanna get started? Let's have a look. So, you're gonna need a lot of stuff to get started with the Raspberry Pi if you don't already have some of the stuff lying around at home. So, as well as getting the Pi itself, uh, the Model B or the Zero or the 400, um, you also wanna get hold of an SD card, a power supply for it. Usually, you can buy the Raspberry Pi specific power supply, a keyboard and a mouse and a screen. Um, like you can just use like a standard screen that you've got at home, but if you don't particularly want it to be connected to a screen all the time, you can, after you do an initial setup, uh, control it through a laptop or a computer um, through SSH. Uh, so you don't sort of need to worry about the screen too much all the time. 
Um, you also need a HDMI cable as well, or a micro HDMI cable to connect it up, depending on what your board has. Um, plus, you know, uh, if you want to put it somewhere, you probably want to buy a case so it's protected. You know, all your accessories for it, you know, hat. Yeah, you can, yeah, it can add up pretty quickly if you haven't got a lot of this stuff lying around at home. So it is like obviously cheaper than a standard computer, but it's also going to be a bit of an initial outlay to get set up and started. In terms of the process though, generally what you do is you either buy an SD card from wherever you're getting it from that comes with the operating system pre-installed, or you'll go ahead and flash an SD card with Noobs or Raspbian, one of those ones to get you started. So you put in the SD card, you plug it in, off you go. Uh, you go ahead and you set up your Wi-Fi on there. Um, and there was a question that came through the chat around how uh, security, you know, how good is the security on these things? And that is a uh, great question. And yeah, pretty much, um, I think as Terry responded there, it's pretty much like as good as you want it to be. So, you know, if you don't change the username and password on your Raspberry Pi, anyone else can get in there. Um, and it is the same username and password for all Raspberry Pis as a standard. So it is recommended that you get in there and you, um, you fix that up. Uh, if you are doing a project that you don't want people to just uh, have, a, have a bit of a play around with. Um, yeah, and honestly, uh, I'll say this with the Arduinos as well, but yeah, the best thing that you want to do to get started with Raspberry Pi or Arduino is to pick a project that you're excited about doing. Uh, for me personally, I find it really easy to lose focus and motivation and energy if I'm just reading through a manual that's quite dry. Um, I like to go and find something that looks pretty cool and something that I'm going to be excited about having an end product for and going from there and getting that hands-on, uh, you know, getting stuck in straight away. That's how I like to learn. Um, okay, so there you go. That is sort of wrapping up your Raspberry Pi. Um, and let's have a look now at how the Arduinos measure up in comparison. So the main difference you're looking at between Arduino and Raspberry Pi is that Arduino is a microcontroller and Raspberry Pi is a microprocessor. So the difference therein is the Arduino is not going to come with a CPU or with RAM or need to be connected up to a screen or a keyboard or a mouse. It is just a, a dumb chip that you will send your code to and it will do the thing. Um, so uh, you want to be using it for projects that um, maybe you're not keen to spend as much money on or that you're, you know, they're simple enough that you do not need to go with the overkill of running it on a Raspberry Pi. Arduino's project I think are probably more common than Raspberry Pi for that particular reason. Um, you can do a lot more simple style projects. And the way that you can sort of look at the way that you might structure something for Arduino is you're taking an input and you're turning it into an output of some kind. If this happens, then this happens and all combinations therein. Um, so that's pretty much what you're looking at with Arduino stuff. Um, a good sort of example project, I suppose, like with your Arduino, is uh, stuff that moves motors, stuff that blinks lights, all that kind of classic electronics type projects. Uh, whereas like Raspberry Pi project example, of course, might be like I had a friend down at Griffith University who built himself like a full on drawing machine. Um, and it was able to take Donald Trump's tweets and draw them out as they were happening. Um, so you get a lot more functionality with the Raspberry Pis than you will with the Arduinos. Um, but yeah, let's, let's jump in and have a look at how it works. So this is what you've got on an Arduino board. You've got an 80 mega chip, which will take your code and execute it on these pins. And you've got a whole range of different pins here for usage. So you've got a range of analog pins, you've got a range of digital pins, and you've also got a few pins that can use PWM or pulse width, width modulation, which is useful for controlling uh, motors and sort of projects that need that type of square wave signal. Um, yeah, so the Arduino in comparison is very simple. So you've got a power import up here, so you don't have to power it through USB if you don't want to. Um, you've got a USB port for plugging it straight in the computer to upload that code. And yeah, it is a fairly simple operation, this one. Much more simple than the Raspberry Pi construction. Uh, let's have a look at our types of Arduino. So you've got like, honestly, there are so many more Arduino types than the ones that I've got in this image here. 
um, but these are the mainstream ones that you're going to find out in the wild. So like the most vanilla one that you'll generally get started with as like a base project or if you come into my university makerspace, the one that I'm going to give you to get started is the Arduino Uno. So it's the, um, the, the sort of the average size one here. And it's, yeah, it's pretty much the, the vanilla sort of nice and large. You can see all the numbers. Um, there's, there's lots of pins here to play with. Uh, it's a good place to start for a project. Um, if size is going to be a problem, uh, you can jump down to the Nano, which um, is a bit special because it can just go straight into a breadboard. Um, yeah, it makes sort of projects that have, you know, sizes that can strain a lot easier and it's sort of pretty much, you know, the, the, you know, packed down to a smaller size. If you're doing like a bit of a bigger project that's going to require a lot more inputs and outputs, you're going to be wanting to look at getting an Arduino Mega, which is, I think, boasting about 52 pins on it, maybe more. Um, yeah, it's huge. It's great for those bigger projects um, to get you started. Um, in the sort of the new age range of Arduino, you've got the ESP types. Um, you've got the, the ESP8266, which has Wi-Fi. Then you've got the ESP32, which also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled. So these chips here, you can tell that they're Wi-Fi enabled because they have a little squiggle on the end. That's how you tell when you're out in the wild. Um, and these ones here are powering a bit of a, a new age generation of IoT or Internet of Things devices, which allow you to start connecting things up around the home to be Wi-Fi connected. So I recently did a big mail out of kits um, that included one of these boards in it um, for my makerspace role where students could put in an expression of interest and receive a free maker kit in the mail. And um, this particular kit included an ESP and um, a moisture sensor so that you could set it up to um, sit next to your plant with the moisture sensor in the plant and it would tell you whether you needed to water your plants or not through a web server that could you know, activate and tell you uh, it was time. And also through a little LED that sat on the side that sort of was different colors depending on um, how wet the soil was. Um, yeah. And the last one here, which is this round board here is the lily pad. And this is specifically designed for wearable technology projects, which is an area that I'm pretty excited about. So the idea with this one is it's round so that it doesn't catch on your clothing uh, when it's embedded in there. And it's got these big, nice tabs sitting on the sides here, which let you use conductive thread to sew into the inputs and sew in sewable LEDs, you know, sewable sensors, all kinds of great stuff that let you do some pretty cool wearable tech projects. And I'm super excited about this space. Like, honestly, when I can start sewing in you know, like heating pads into a jacket, all that kind of stuff, I'm going to be there. Um, I recently did a big project making like a big wraparound 3D printed shoulder thing, um, which is sort of sitting behind me here. I might get it out a bit later. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And it's based on this kind of stuff. And I can control all the lights in it through an app on my phone, uh, which is pretty fantastic. So yeah, lots of great stuff in the world of Arduino. And I think one of the cool things about Arduino is that you can also get bootleg Arduinos. Uh, which are even cheaper. <laughs> so uh, many of you have seen, have probably heard of the wonders of websites like AliExpress, Banggood, Gearbest, all of those fantastic websites. Um, so uh, as a bit of a price check here, you can see that at Core Electronics, you can get the, uh, um, the genuine Arduino, which you can tell is genuine because it has a little Arduino Infinity logo on it and also generally a map of Italy on the back where it's manufactured uh, for about 39 bucks at the moment. So yeah, it's up there. Uh, or you can pick up the, the Uno R3, which is the uh, bootleg version that Core Electronics sells for $13.20. Or you can pick up the even more bootleg version um, from you know, AliExpress for about four bucks each. And the bootleg ones, the main difference that you're going to find is that like these ones are like, usually for me, I find that maybe two units in an order of 60 are going to be duds. Um, but still, for the, for the money you're paying, it, yeah, it's still very worth it. And they operate exactly the same. The main difference um, in terms of their operation is going to be the chipset they use. So these uh, bootleg Arduinos use a cheaper chipset called the 3H, CH340G. 
skip set. I uh, hope you remember that uh, for the quiz at the end. Not really, just kidding. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you find that you plug in one of these and it's not immediately being registered by your computer, you need to download the special driver and install it. And then you can get started with bootleg Arduino projects. It's very exciting. So I generally only exclusively use bootleg Arduinos for all my projects. And you certainly don't need to spend the extra money. Uh, but if you would like to support the real Arduino company um, and you're happy to pay the money, yeah, and you want the, the superior golden experience, uh, definitely go ahead and grab the genuine Arduinos. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at some example projects. So Arduinos uh, are projects that, yeah, it's, I do a lot of Arduino projects. I'm pretty keen on them. So you can see here that this is one of my uh, favorite projects that I've made. This is a Polograph drawing machine. And essentially this is an open source project. It was one of my first ones that I got started with. And what you do is you get an Arduino and a motor shield type hat that sits on top. You connect up two stepper motors and you, you can 3D print out a little gondola. And essentially when you plug this one in, you can send it any picture and it'll sketch it out for you. And it's very satisfying and hypnotic to watch. And I often have this on sort of in-person live displays where um, like for open days at the university, I have this going. This year, because it was all online, of course, for the open day, I had a live stream of it going and was taking requests all day. Um, so this is one of the more advanced high level Arduino projects. Um, that you can do. So it's not just, you know, simple stuff. You can also get quite carried away with some open source Arduino stuff too. One of my more recent projects as well has been making uh, the thing behind me here, which is called Party Button. And I'm pretty excited because this one was recently featured in an article in Diode Magazine. How exciting. Um, and this project anyway was um, born out of uh, someone who came in the Makerspace and they said, oh, Steph, do you want some traffic lights? And I was like, of course I want some traffic lights for a project. Please give them to me. And, uh, so I got a real walking man green traffic light from this guy. And um, straight away I tore out all the old green LEDs and replaced them with auto color cycling rainbow LEDs, of course. And then I also went ahead and bought one of these real traffic light buttons from AliExpress, of course. And then I was able to wire it all together and make uh, the party button come to life. So when you come in and you press the button, it plays the classic traffic light sound. It goes, boop, boop, and then it goes, boop, 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 and then it transitions into one of 10 randomized party tracks, uh, which is a bit of fun. So it's a great way to sort of get people interested in seeing what you can do with these projects at work. And one of the things that I um, really like to do is display all of the electronics in like a bit of a clear case. So you can actually see what's going on and you can start to understand how these things are built. Um, so you can see a bit of a, a close up picture um, of that there. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty excited about this project. And recently I, um, I might've gotten some funding for this project to turn it into a real traffic fixture for, for like a, an art exhibition, uh, which is gonna be pretty exciting. It's gonna look, yeah, absolutely ridiculous. It's going to have a stainless steel weld and frame. And it's going to have security camera on the side that's going to be like bopping its head to the music and like face tracking. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be wild. It's going to be it's going to, it's going to be a good time. And uh, you'll see it on my Twitter when I officially announce uh, this project. Anyway, um, but yeah, you've got a few more example Arduino projects there as well. Uh, you've got, you know, you can also do plant monitoring as well with Arduino. Uh, you can do, um, uh, you know, stuff like robotics and animatronics where you're controlling a range of servo motors to complete something. You know, you can be doing a robot arm, all kinds of great projects. Honestly, there is Arduino projects for days. And um, if you Google it, you'll likely find someone that's tried to do it with Arduino. Uh, but in terms of getting started, uh, what you'll need is um, generally a bit of a, just a, a basic Arduino kit. So if you can just, you know, if you just want to go to your local J car and pick up just a stock standard Arduino kit, that is a fantastic place to start. Um, but what, the main things that you're looking for in a kit, which they will most certainly have, uh, is a breadboard, some jumper wires, some LEDs and some project parts, maybe a sensor of some kind, maybe a photoresistor, like a light sensor, maybe, maybe a servo motor, all those kinds of bits and pieces that can give you a bit of a taster of how to put together a project. 
Uh, but essentially the way you do a project generally is you would get your Arduino and you would put your breadboard next to it and you would start, you know, putting some wires in your Arduino and then into your breadboard and hooking them up to different things, uploading your code and off you go. So that's pretty much your process. Um, we'll have a quick peek at um, the Arduino editor as well. So you can download the IDE software, which is your integrated development environment software, which is where you write all your code. Um, you can download that as a software, or you can also use the web editor as well, which we'll take a bit of a look at here. So um, in here, you can start to write your code that will be uploaded to your Arduino. And generally the code always has void setup and void loop in there. So it is a very sort of straightforward process. Um, so you would go in here and you would say things like, I want this connected up to pin one as an output. I want this connected up to pin two as an input. And then um, down in your void loop area, you write the code that gets cycled continuously. Um, so stuff like, uh, I want this light to turn on and then I want there to be a delay and I want it to turn off and then another delay. So that is your pretty much uh, under the examples area here. That is probably your classic blink sketch here. This is one of the first ones that you generally do if you're starting up with Arduino. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, you can sort of read through it here. You can see that this is all commented out um, and you would go ahead in here and you would say, uh, you could either put this as, you know, one of the pin numbers or this one also just flashes the built-in LED on it as well, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, goes ahead and says, turn this LED on high to turn it on, uh, a delay of a thousand milliseconds, and then turn it off, another delay. Um, so yeah, like Arduinos are a great place to start for a basic project. I would generally suggest going from Arduino to Raspberry Pi um, as a bit of a, a sequence of events if you are looking at getting started. Uh, but yeah, there's so much great stuff out there and I'm excited to see um, any projects that you guys build. A uh, question from John, is Pi better if you don't know how to code? Uh, generally with both projects, the way that I sort of tend to operate um, is I sort of hunt around online and try to find like, you know, similar projects that people have done and you can sort of edit that code to fit. Whatever you're doing within these both projects, like, Honestly, every type of sensor and every type of input has its own little special language and things around it so that, you know, writing things from scratch and expecting yourself to learn, you know, um, you know, Ruby coding for Raspberry Pi or C plus for Arduino is a bit unreasonable. Like you generally don't write code from scratch. You just go and find a similar project, grab that and adjust it to fit, essentially. That is what I would normally do for a project. Um, yeah, so yeah, don't feel like you need to sit down and learn how to code and don't let coding sort of scare you off from doing any projects like this. You can generally read through the code, figure out what it means pretty easily if it's commented well, and yeah, just go from there and make something. Uh, anyway, uh, that's about it sort of for my talk. I will now go and uh, let you guys start up the panel. Thanks, Steph. Oh, hello. Uh, I'd like to invite back to the stage uh, the wonderful Evan Wyatt and uh, Terry O'Connor. If you could please come on down, that'd be great. So while they're doing that, let's just have a look at a, a, a couple of things that came out of uh, some stuff that Steph was, was saying. Um, firstly, my experience, I bought a, a Pi Zero uh, because I was in a computer store in the US and it was five bucks. So here's my first Pi. There it is. That's a zero. Actually, this is the zero W and there's a little chip in there that is, um, is the Wi-Fi chip. Uh, the one that I first bought, which I subsequently put into a little cute case. And they're like, that's the complete Raspberry Pi. Um, was enough to, to work. I put a USB hub on the end of that, put a keyboard and a mouse, and then managed to configure Linux to uh, talk to a, a Wi-Fi dongle. So pretty much not much bigger space than that. I had the complete computer. Now, these aren't fast. Um, they are the sort of thing that you might use for a single job in, in a radio station. You could certainly run an internet terminal on these, you know, with one of these, but they're not particularly fast. But it's a Linux environment. The, the actual full-size Pi 
So there we go. I'm just comparing the two. Um, this is, now this is not the latest one. This is one back. I'm not necessarily allowed to spend that much money. Uh, but this has, supports a single screen. So there it's HDMI on the side. It's got an audio interface. Power goes in. Um, you can attach a camera. And then there are the, um, well, you really can't see it through the reflective case. But the, no, you can't at all. The GPI connectors. And you can, you can buy uh, little breakout kits that allow you to take those wires and do something more useful with them. The thing is that this, this is a complete computer, but it's a complete computer where pins are exposed so that you can go and do the sort of thing that Terry did, write the, have the program that turns an area of the screen bright red, but triggered from a wire coming in. These are a computer. The Arduino is much more like a process controller and it, you know, it's running on, on this Atmel chip or a, a PIC if you really wanted to go and make one from scratch. But these have been bundled up with an onboard monitor and enough storage to, to do something sensible. Now we ran, it's three years ago now, we ran the education day for Technorama and we had the Raspberry Pi and everybody who attended that, uh, we gave one of these. Well, actually that's, uh, <laughs> This is the same thing. This is a, an Uno with a screen on the front. So we gave everybody an Uno and a screen and everybody wrote a program. And now I hadn't plugged this in for three years. So I got this and I plugged it in and it went bright white. And I thought, oh shit. And then came the hello world and it's just sitting there doing something or other. I think it's talking about the volts on one of the chips. But we did actually do more than that in the class. The interesting thing, um, you know, and I, I, I agree with what Steph said, that when you go and buy something from Banggood, which is my go-to supplier, or AliExpress, and you pay bugger all, you buy the cheap option, you're sort of taking your life in your hands. But I've had, you know, very close to 100% success rate. What I find is sometimes the quality of the really cheap ones isn't terribly good. And who knows, they've probably found them in the discard skip of a factory that's making a higher quality product. And these are the ones that have been rejected, you know, like the fish that John West rejects. Yeah, I got all the reject fish. So long and thanks. But the fact is they, they all sort of worked and they weren't particularly expensive. Now that's, um, that's a screen. This is a slightly bigger screen. And I'll show you, this is um, in Arduino terms, this is called a shield. And those pins are in a standard place where they will fit perfectly happily onto the sockets. Very difficult, oh, hang on, let me, more light. There we go, there we go. Um, the shield will just fit onto those pins. But if you look, you compare the mega, um, hang on, let me make sure I've got these in the same orientation, which I don't, there we go. So that one there is an Arduino mega. And this one here is an Arduino Uno. And except for the fact that this has got additional pins on it, they're essentially the same. They'll run the same code. It's just you don't have to do pin breakouts on the big one. You just have more pins to do more things. They will run the same programs. Uh, you can get all kinds of sub boards. This one I got. This is an Ethernet shield for an Arduino. So this will just go on top of that one, bang. Um, and then if you've sort of done it correctly, uh, there'd be pins on the top of this where you could then put a screen over the top of that. And the, the shields are frequently architected so you can just stack them, stack them, stack them, stack them. Um, and they use the same pins until you, know, you sort of run out of room or, or case or whatever. Now, to make that work, uh, those of you who've got any programming background, the Arduino is, itself is not terribly complex, but it, there are libraries available. So you don't have to work out how to write to the screen. You load a screen display library, and then you write to the library. Um, so that's how you drive that. It's, it's how you would drive the ethernet. It's how you would drive the Wi-Fi. It's, it's really a matter of dealing with building blocks. A word of warning though, although they almost look like they're compatible and, and frequently look fairly similar, um, Pi 
boards, which are called hats, and Arduino boards, which are called shields, are not compatible. Um, one of them is 3.3 volts, the other one is 5 volts. So if you put the wrong one on, A, not good things are likely to happen, and B, high potential for smoke to come out. What you need to know is what you're doing. It's possible to connect Pis and Arduinos together, and there are many projects which show that. What, what I'd like to do, and then we'll sort of throw it to open discussion, is sort of uh, just talk about the experience I had last night when I went into Steph's Makerspace. And I'm going to say this was a sort of a revelation. I was not expecting this. Um, she showed me the 3D printers and I went, well, I've never really seen a 3D printer. I have no idea how one of those works. She said, well, you know, come over here, sit, sit me down and showed me um, a website, said log into that and have a look. Now, what I need to do here is just share my appropriate screen, which I think is going to be that one. And so this is myminifactory.com, one of several sites that is dedicated to things you could download and then just print. So if you don't know what you're doing, this is the hello world experience. And I was looking at stuff here, oh, good heavens, the Mandalorian, I could make a COVID cookie cutter. How wonderful that you could make, make a cookie that looks like a virus. Yes. And then I saw this and I went, well, that looks like a panel with buttons and sliders on it. So we clicked into that. Um, Steph was barely able to contain me. And here is, the, here is this project. Now, this is the point at which the lights started coming on because Steph had said, look, if you want to come in here and print off a 3D model, feel free. I had no idea what would be a good thing to print off. This project is something that you could use in a community radio station. It's really cute. It's 12 buttons and two pots and you can program it to control things. I thought originally that these were self-legending buttons. In fact, no, the, the legends have just been printed and put under plastic caps. That, by the way, you can print on the 3D printer if you are so taken. Uh, this is the back of the device. So you can see it's a fairly nicely made case with a little power supply on the back here. And this is what it looks like internally. And you can see it's an array of 12 switches. There's basically not much more in there than the four pots, the 12 switches, diodes to make up a matrix and a small dedicated Pi. And then what comes out of that is USB connection. Arduino and you can... Nano. Sorry, it's an Arduino Nano. Sorry, you're right. You're right. Um, I was getting enthusiastic. And that can come out then and drive, um, drive MIDI. Now you go like, really? I'm going to drive MIDI? Well, really cheap MIDI to USB interface, at which point you can talk to a very large amount of software. Um, the, we'll, we'll put the link for this up in the chat and distribute it later. The guy who did this project has prepared the most wonderful manual. So if you've got a quarter of a brain, this would be a not terribly expensive Christmas break project. All you need is the 3D printer, small number of parts, and a little bit of time. And he shows you exactly how to do everything. He's got the code, how it all clips together. It is a really interesting project. I was very, very taken by it. Um, Rob, who's in the Yukon, put a comment in the chat before about some very useful audio interfaces. And in fact, he was pointing at, at this one, which is uh, an output board. So this will go on the back of a oh. Raspberry Pi. Yep. And will deliver you, you know, plus four audio out. He doesn't, th these guys don't do a plus four in, but they do have some um, RCA in and out. Um, Hi-Fi Berry, it turns out, is a Swiss company. Um, it's not cheap, but it's really well made, really quite mm. beautiful. And they have a great, um, on their website, they have a great set of bundles and things you can do, including the Musos bundle, and they've, they've got some good cases. Um, and by the way, my view on cases, having bought a couple, is uh, like <laughs> the Raspberry Pi here cost five bucks. The case cost me 10 bucks. 
think about that. The, the case is basically just laser cut perspex. Um, the thing is, when you spent 10 bucks on that, it does protect the investment and you very quickly forget that you spent 10 bucks and you look at, at the rest of it and go, Ooh, it's a $5 computer. So uh, cute. I, I think it's probably a relatively good idea to go and look at some of these things that are available and use those as the basis of of projects because as Steph said you really don't want to be starting something from scratch whether you can or not is another matter but to go and take somebody's work and modify it and get it to do something that is useful to you is a really good starting spot. Thanks John. Um, we're going to go to questions now from uh, everyone in the chat. Uh, if you want to ask your question and uh, want to ask it in audio form, please put your hand up in the group chat and um, I will flick your mic on. But for now, we've got a question from David Webb uh, for the panel, which is, what's the best Raspberry Pi for software defined radio? Software. Soft, soft, yeah, yeah, there was a bit of a typo. Software defined oh. radio. Yes. Um, Evan, do you want to try that one on for size? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what does he mean by software? Well, the software defined radio okay. is where you have the radio receiver chip that is entirely controlled by, by being driven by software. So I, I did actually put a, a link back. I just went on, on, on uh, the web and said, Raspberry Pi software defined radio. And there's a whole heap of hits. So uh, the project that I put a link up to is an example of using the Pi to control the software-defined radio oh, right. to track planes. <clears throat> the thing about the software-defined radio is that via the Pi, you can retune it, you can change its um, operating characteristics if you're using it for communications. Yeah. You could change the bandwidth, the Q, the, okay. the frequency to which it's tuned, all of that. Fair enough. I can see where he's coming from. I was thinking of another direction with another project I did was touchscreen, Raspberry Pi touchscreen. Built the web page as touch buttons, programmed it all up. And if you're sitting in your studio and you want to listen to BBC radio, boom, fade it up. Mm. Want to listen to Karma radio, touch it, fade it up. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of, that's slightly different to what she was talking about. But yeah. you know, that that's what I was thinking when I said, oh, define radio, yes. Well, no maybe, maybe it'd be good to find out from David what what sort of software defined radio requirements he was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, 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 would be good. Maybe you can expand on that for us. What do you think? David's asked another question uh, in tandem of off the piggybacking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it uh, reads like this, what do you need to stream from a Raspberry Pi? Hmm. Well, as you see, I threw an answer back there to David on that one. Um, there's some good programs out there. There's quite a few, but the ones that I've found easy to use, simple to, to um, configure is Icecast 2. And also there's one out of UK, which I've used quite a lot, is called OpenOB. Um, OpenOB has the advantage of it's got a low, um, it's, it's, um, it's pretty well, when you're doing it live, it's pretty well, you know, it's a couple of milliseconds delay, that's about it. So Icecast, depends on what you're caching and that is, could be up to, you know, five seconds delay. In streaming to streaming out and picking up a receiver, but two easy to use software programs, and that's on the command line too. If you want to then go up to the graphics, um, if you want to load up a, a desktop on the Raspberry Pi, the Pixel desktop, which is quite powerful, especially on the new Raspberry Pis, um, you can start using all those other applications out there like Butt, um, you know, Edcast. Um, and they'll run on the Pi quite nicely too. So, but I like to keep those sort of jobs, keep the overhead down, load up a very basic um, Raspberry Pi operating system, the Raspberry or the Debian Lite, where all that stuff is stripped off, no desktop, no nothing. So all you're doing is streaming audio and just keeps overheads down. So they're the two I go for. Mm. I was going to say, John, that is the um, streaming device that I use mm -hmm. occasionally. Um, I'm not sure whether people can see that. Yep. Um, uh, it is a Raspberry Pi 2, and that has the um, uh, the Fat Max audio um, uh, chip uh, audio I/O card on it. It gives you um, something that's missing on a lot of um, PC sound cards, 
a volume control for the input level and, a, and another volume control for the output level. Um, and that works quite nicely. I actually have a streaming radio service running from home mm. um, using that very device. <clears throat> That actually in illustrates the power of these devices, which is they're cheap enough that you can dedicate a process to the device and then put just enough control over the top, like just enough touch screen to be able to switch it from one thing to another or just enough to be able to adjust the parameters around it and then have the device go off and just do the one thing. Um, and that not only means you can optimize the way it performs, it also gives you a better chance of keeping it out of the hands of people who might want to come in and, and fiddle because essentially <laughs> you can arrange it. So there's nothing to fiddle with. I, I have a question for Steph um, in, in both Arduino and Raspberry Pi. What's the most complex project that you've ever seen implemented? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably like the um, like the drawing machine one that was pretty complex that I mentioned. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I feel like you can get pretty damn carried away with some of these projects. Mm. Um, yeah, probably probably the the live feed of Donald Trump's tweets being drawn on a drawing machine uh, was pretty cool. Have Have you seen Have you seen any uh, sort of you know competitive uh, or, or other examples where people have gone and used multiple pies or multiple pies and Arduinos coupled together to to achieve anything. I mean, like, like let's go as far out as we can and, and be ridiculous as possible. Mm, that's a that's a good question. Like, I feel like I've probably seen like some pretty cool battle bots type type scenarios built on Arduino, mm. uh, but I haven't been able to sort of peek under the hood under the some of the real like Robo Wars stuff, which is our Australian version of BattleBots. Um, that'd be pretty interesting to find out. I imagine you could do some pretty wild things with those. Mm. Um, My dad built a um, stem cell extractor machine with Arduino, which is pretty cool. Yeah, as he's, you do. He's actually in the chat at the moment. He just said that. Hi, Dad. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Can I just show a couple of other things? I was just looking at what Terry had there too, um, with the pie and those top hats you were talking about, Terry, you had. Yep. Actually, believe it or not, Jcar have got those too. They're a bit of a knockoff from the Hi-Fi Berries. And they're about $70 and $60, something like that. Hi-Fi Berries, a little bit more, but a better card, as John was saying. And as you say, put the Raspi on the top hat audio card, plug them together, and just put them on. There it is. It's all good to go. Just like you were showing, Terry. Yep. The other thing I do use quite a lot is... A Behringer USB interface for audio out and in on a Raspberry Pi, they're good. And if you really want to go a little bit upmarket, go for the Focusrite. Mm. Really nice box. They're $250 a box USB, but they are good. If you want some really good quality out of the Raspberry Pi, stick the Raspberry Pi on that and you really get some good quality. They'll do balanced um, microphone or line inputs there. You can do monitoring um, and 48 volt as well under your mics. So if you want to do some serious audio for the Raspberry Pi, perfect. It, it's the same story as the case. It's, it's where the peripheral exactly. becomes many, many times more valuable than the actual device that's, that's yeah. doing the work. So doing it, it's, the work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just the bizarre model that, yep. that you can get. That's right. We have another question from Harry. This is, how resistant are they to hacking or infiltration, knowing that they can be accessed uh, by Wi-Fi? Hmm. Well, firstly, the Wi-Fi stack that the Pi is using, I mean, it's a, it's a Linux stack. It's not going to be any better or worse than any other Wi-Fi stack. Uh, hmm. Most routers are running on some form of embedded Linux. So if you've got your Wi-Fi set up, so you've got a reasonably good password, you're using reasonably good encryption rather than no encryption, then it's probably no more hackable than any other computer with the advantage that you could lock up the whole Pi. And you know, if you really wanted to lock it up, uh, I, I worked in um, uh, pay television where the devices that was making the keys 
that were going out over the air for the security system, those devices were small computers that were actually locked in a safe. The only thing that was going in and out was a power cord and a single cable that had keys coming out. And you, you know, how far do you want to go with security? I don't think you need to worry about Linux as a secure environment. Uh, if you want to lock down uh, Raspbian, it, I think it'd be as secure as any other environment, probably mm. substantially better than Windows. Yes. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I agree. Uh, let, sorry. let me just, sorry, I was going to show something. Just So um, Evan was talking about how this is portable. Um, I've started carrying some things around with me. Like I, I always carry my laptop. Laptop's actually pretty heavy, but I carry it around everywhere. But I've, I've also carried other things. The, the Pi 400, the computer and the keyboard for, well, the computer, the case, all the connectors, everything um, is sort of sitting up there under $120 for everything. Mm -hmm. Really, all you need to put on that is maybe a mouse and a screen. Okay, here's an example of a screen. So this is one that I carry with me. This is a full-size screen. Um, it's just got HDMI on the side. It's absolutely straight, ready to connect into the Pi. Um, it... Uh, this has batteries in it, so this will run for about two or three hours on its internally internal batteries, but you can run it on external batteries. So my device of choice now is, um, this is an Aldi battery. This is a four ampere hour Aldi battery. So that costs about, uh, what are they, about $35 or something? And um, once upon a time, Aldi, who never have anything more than once, this came in another kit but this is a pair of usbs and it just clips on there so that is now about six or seven hours of pretty serious pi running power um that you can use on a plane or a bus or a train or um you know sitting under a cooler bar tree so if you look at all that and you say well how much volume does that really occupy you get the battery, you get the screen, you get the keyboard. And here's the pie. And how about that battery, John? Yeah. Well, exactly. You can run, you could run a, a pie for a reasonable amount of time on that. Well, that 10,000 amp hour would probably run the pie all day. Well, it might not because the, <laughs> um, the, the latest Raspberry Pi um, puts out an extraordinary amount of heat. Uh, you, you sort of really don't want to run it without a heat sink. Uh, mm. because it, I think it gets to like 70 degrees C yep. in a few minutes. Yep. Uh, it's interesting. Actually, yeah. And just on that one, Steph, too, I don't know if you've come across it. You've been dealing with the latest Raspberry Pi 4s. Have you come across any uh, situations where the CPU has just taken off, just maxed at 100%, sat there, and you sure, just watch the temperature of the CPU going up? That's pretty interesting. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. It's happened to be on some software and I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Oh my gosh, that's wild. Uh, okay, I've got about, another... Oh, sorry, oh, John. No, I was going to say, what about making cases? Because, you know, one of the things that you can do with a 3D printer, and, and we will run a 3D printing uh, seminar sometime early next year, um, but of course, you know, I went and bought these cases uh, because I could and I don't have a 3D printer, but uh, that's... If you have clear filament, presumably, there are plenty of designs. You can make these yourself and just print them off and there's a case for like pennies. Oh yeah, off you go. You can't do like crystal clear stuff with 3D printing, um, but yeah, you can be churning out cases and enclosures and additions to your project on the 3D printers for days. Like there's so mm. many great open source projects out there ready to go, like the one you showed, where you can 3D print all the parts, put together all the electronics and off you go. Mm. We've got a, um, an audio question from Mike Tobin. So I'm going to uh, allow him to talk. Uh, please be ready, Mike. Uh, I'm unmuting you now. You'll have to unmute your own microphone though. I've just given you permission to talk. There we are. More a statement than a question. Um, um, Pi is used as uh, uh, streaming to replace STL, so it's a very economical uh, approach to getting a signal from the studio to the transmitter. Uh, you, you mean in the sense of, say, replacing a... Um, oh, oh. A point link or something. Um, no, no, the, the device is... Not, not the link itself. Um, oh, what's the one that Chris loves? Help. The, the, um, 
the appliance Ubiqu Ubiqu encoder Ubiqu decoder. You, the, uh, no, no, no. The appliance encoder, the audio encoder decoder pairs. It's okay. Continue on. Continue on. Continue on. Just keep going. Brian, you got this. Brian, Brian. Yeah. But, but the, co the concept of, of, you know, you can go and get a commercial device or you can go and get your own encoder um, and make something that is using uh, one of the casting protocols so that you have an encoder and a decoder at the other end and base those on probably on Pi's rather than Arduino's. But there is your own homegrown um, appliance ready to go. Mm. And, and in terms of uh, having um, reduced costs of riggers climbing towers and put up aerials and for SDL links, it yeah, becomes very economical. It, just on the, that one, Mike, uh, what I've, um, as I was talking earlier about the OpenOB software, it's based on uh, G Streamer, which is a pretty popular um, video audio streamer. And this guy in the UK, he worked for BBC and he's developed it years ago, but it's quite good actually. It's a really nice, easy to use program. And the latency is, I don't know, 20, 30 milliseconds or something like that, you know? And you put, and you run that on a Raspberry at both ends as, as you stream, just, it's just good enough, you know? I've, I've always said that latency doesn't matter if you've got nothing to compare it with. Yeah, unless someone in the studio wants to listen up there. Yeah. They'll get a slight delay, but it's not that bad that it throws you. Yeah. The encoding uh, that's used in OpenOB is actually the Opus codec. Yeah. And and uh, according to some of the internet forums, um, the European Broadcasting Union has been adopting uh, Opus as the uh, standard for contribution links for um, outside broadcasts across Europe. Mm. Yeah, that's no, quite good. I got it running here on a couple of boxes all the time and you know just using it, testing it, playing with it, configuring it. And you know studio if, transmitter link. Yeah. yeah. If the EBU is using it, you know it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. I'm just going to um meet but, uh, you. Yeah, while you're looking for more questions, I've got a, a the demo project I mentioned earlier here to show you guys. So this one here is like a bit of a light up shoulder wrap. It's pretty wild. Um, all of the points on here are all 3D printed. I and like yeah, the idea is that you can control it through your phone uh, yep. through an app. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit wild. Uh, I want to sort of wear it to a fancy dinner so that I can look like a fashion warlord. I was um, just going to say, if you've been game enough to wear it out at night somewhere in a hotel bar oh, or something yeah. like that. No. Oh, yeah, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. This is the future of fashion. Future. Conversation starter. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, yeah. it's be great. Yeah. <laughs> And what, where's, where's the, um, where's, where's the driving device? Where is it hiding? Uh, so it's hiding in the back there. So this is powered by a sort of a, like a variation of the Arduino called the Pixel yep. Blaze board, which comes oh, yeah. with our stuff there for doing LED strip driving. Uh, right. It comes with its yep. own software ready okay. to go for controlling all of them. Yeah, it's a bit of fun. How many hours, how many hours running time? Oh, good question. I don't know. But I'll give you a bit of a close up to this is the actual like 3D print. No, oh, yeah. I was able to 3D print directly onto fabric to make this one, uh, which is a bit of fun. So you, well, get, you get very creative with these projects. <laughs> Abe Killian, your kit is on its way, but we're going to require you to wear it on air. Mm. <laughs> yes, the comment is fashion warlord. I'm adopting that. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a question for everyone. Um, in terms of like practicality for stations that aren't very well resourced, uh, what do you think the easeability of making something that would be able to track, you know, when the studio goes off air or if the server room gets too hot? Um, how easy would something like that be to create and implement at a station level? Mm. Not, not very hard at all. That, no. that's, the, that's the sort mm. of thing for which um, the Arduino is perfect because you're essentially talking about sensing and process control. Mm. But if you wanted to be able to send an email or messages or something, then it might be better to go the full hog, go with the Raspberry Pi because you've got routines that will let you, you know, like embedded routines that will let you easily send um, mm. emails and do computing sort of things and just tie into the pins in the same way as, as Terry's example, turns on a red light. Um, you connect that off to sensors 
and write a program to interpret the census. And the program to interpret the census is probably the easiest bit to do. Mm. Yep. Python. Yeah, I, sorry. I was going to say Python. Um, if you look at the Raspberry Pi Foundation website, um, Python is the programming language of, of choice, and that's what's being taught um, to kids in schools in the UK at the moment. Mm. We've got a um, live chat from Raymond Murray, my um, one of my creators. I'll uh, allow him to speak. <laughs> uh, Dad, you'll have to unmute your own mic. Sorry, Raymond, you'll have to unmute your own mic. There we go. Hey, Hello. everyone. <laughs> Hi, Raymond. Yeah, on the uh, Raspberry Pi, I use... Um, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with Delphi or Delphi, mm -hmm. uh, the programming mm -hmm. language by uh, Borland. Mm -hmm. so that's a long, that's There's a, uh, uh, a version that uses Free Pascal. Wow. As the underlying... Yep, and you can use Lazarus to uh, write software on the uh, Raspberry Pi as well. And it's a very uh, powerful thing, and it's object-oriented and everything, uh, and you can do the GUIs and everything. You can write it on your Windows PC and then just re recode it, uh, re recompile it to run on the Raspberry Pi, or you can actually run it straight from the Raspberry Pi, Pi the compiler and all, and, and the uh, IDE. So uh, that's another programming language that you can use on it. Obviously, there's others, there's C and the whole bit. But uh, yeah, if anybody wants to use Pascal, which is uh, very good for uh, strong typecasting, uh, that type of thing. Um, and I find um, once it's compiled, you don't even need the compiler anymore and you don't need an interpreter mm. where, where, where if you're running Pi, you've actually got to run the interpreter at the same time. So you're cutting down on overheads, and like you say, if you're running Linux with a, you know, where it's cut down and you're running a bare minimum uh, system, so it doesn't have to uh, work hard. A pre-compiled uh, piece of software will run faster than running through an interpreter. So mm -hmm. that that's that's why I use it. But um, you know, that's it's all horses for courses and another language to learn if you're not familiar with it. Raymond, what projects have you done? Created oh, outstanding. Mate, I, I just muck around with different things, but um, uh, essentially I just write software and build electronic projects for, you know, different people sort of thing. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, anything useful for radio? Sorry? Anything useful for radio we could use in radio? Uh, nothing off... Um, off the bat for radio in particular, no. Um, but, I, you know, I don't see... Oh, another thing too, with um, if you're using uh, Android as your operating system, have you, have you had a look at the MI2 website? For, uh, like, it's a visual uh, programming for um, uh, Android? Mm -hmm. No. Have any of you ever seen that? But no? you're talking about Android, Android on a Pi? Is that what you're... Yes, doing? yes, oh, okay. and, yeah, and for apps. So if you wanted to run an app on your phone to talk to your Raspberry Pi thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the MI2. Uh, it's, oh, I can send you a link to it anyway if you want. Very easy to use. Uh, visual. Uh, so you, you get your whole... Uh, GUI interface, you can send emails, text messages, blah, 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 blah uh, from the Android app as well uh, that you write. Uh, it, it's kind of limited where it's probably not as good as, say, if you're using your Java or, or the like, but it's very quick and easy to use. Mm. Um, I would suggest you look at it if you're interested in doing anything, uh, if you're running your Pies on, on an Android uh, operating system um so yeah that's another one that i use very um, interesting thought Can yeah you tell us about your stencil machine you mentioned in the comments oh yeah well actually i control that with an android app that i wrote on that mi2 as well um and basically uh yeah the 
the the Android looks after all the timing of uh, of the uh, uh, the sonication and and uh, timings for uh, splitting uh, the 800 nanometer cells uh, from uh, adult stem cells uh, and splitting them open and and releasing the stem cells uh, from adipose tissue, which is uh, like they give somebody liposuction and uh, they suck out the fat and they run it through this machine and it extracts the stem cells and they inject the stem cells back into the patient within 20 minutes of actually extracting them. Uh, and they uh, it's used, you know, for uh, cartilage damage, that sort of thing. And yeah, yeah, they use it for a number of things. Yeah. This is like, you know, hello, what did you do tonight? Oh, I, you know, just stem cell <laughs> machine on a Raspberry Pi under, yeah, uh, under yeah. Android. Um, yeah, like I, you know, I do this on the kitchen table, and <laughs> you must be very popular at home. <laughs> Sorry, is my camera on? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Your camera, yeah, camera is back. Right I, just, I thought you were over the world, you know. No, Hannah, it's not I, very I, popular. <laughs> I, I thought you were just sort of hiding. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Raymond. Look, I, I just bring bring uh, come back to something that um, I did just think of, which is the use of Raspberry Pis in a radio station to replace traditional um, platforms. One of them is uh, running an intranet. So I think for about six or seven years at 2NSB, we ran an intranet that ran on Linux. It was great because nobody understood anything about it. It made it pretty much unlikely to be touched. And it, it indeed, it ran for something like five years between boots. If you're writing code that is HTML and PHP for an intranet, that will run quite happily on a Pi in a dedicated environment. And again, being able to isolate the environment creates an enormous level of security that you wouldn't necessarily get if the application is running on a shared machine. But you can also take, uh, and, and people have done this, and I'd love to see this um, written up as a proper project, is running some full-fledged applications on the Pi. And one of those is Rivendell, the automation system. So that's a broadcast automation system that runs on Linux and it will run on a Raspberry Pi quite mm. happily. Yeah. What's that station in Tasmania again? Is it Edge? Um, Probably. That is a station in Tasmania, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just trying to think of the name of it. Um, I had it somewhere, yeah, look, they pack, I was, talking to the guys about that last mm. year. And yes, it's quite amazing. Rivendell is a full-blown professional Linux-based um, automation. Broadcast automation system, radio. Yeah. Does everything, mm. scheduling the whole lot. Um, and these guys managed to compile the whole thing, get it running on a Raspberry Pi, and like, wow, you know? Yeah. And you can just go to the site, download the file. It's all configured. Just load onto your Pi, run it, and it, it goes. Mm. No configuration, or very basic configuration. Yeah. That's and the great thing is, package. I know if, it, <laughs> if it breaks and you want to take it home and work on the kitchen table, I mean, you just pick yeah. up the whole thing. It's yeah. that big. That's right. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Look, um, the, gonna... the person in the chat who said barracks box. Yes, that was what I was thinking of. Thank you very much. Barracks. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. That was the one. Yeah. 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 That's it. Hannah. Look, uh, it's apparent to me that this conversation could go for hours and hours and hours and we could, you know, really nut through it all and have a great time. But unfortunately, um, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, make sure that uh, if you haven't already become a member of the Community Tech Q&A Facebook page, that you're a member. And if you have any questions, burning questions, things that you need to know, uh, we can definitely pick up the discussion there. Uh, thank you so much to all our wonderful panelists for tonight. Thank you so much to Steph Piper of Elke Education. Uh, so amazing to see your presentation. Thank you so much. And Thanks, thank you to Steph. our glorious panel, Terry O'Connor and uh, Evan Wyatt, and of course, uh, John Mazels. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, before I let you uh, go into the night. Um, it would be really useful if you could fill out the feedback forms at the end of the webinar. It really helps us, especially right now, we're making the program for next year. So if you have any recommendations of things you want to learn for next year, or just any feedback, tell us how amazing um, uh, you thought Steph's uh, cape was. Uh, do it. Tell us. Tell us all about it.
Mm. And Hannah, oh, look, if I, if I could say something that Steph wouldn't, but the, the project that she's kicked off, um, Elkie, is really quite amazing. One of the things that is really important, I alluded to this at the start of the session, is we've got to be encouraging the people who are coming up behind us. And, uh, you know, Terry and Evan and I are, okay, we're of an age. I don't think any of us thinks we've got any older, but, you know, we're of an age. Um, when we were kids, we were doing stuff with bits and pieces because we could, and nobody thought that was weird. These days, it's much harder to get involved in that stuff, but we need to encourage the next generation to do it. So if you've got kids or you've got friends who have kids or you've got, uh, you know, somebody for whom you would like a stocking stuffer Christmas present where the recipient could do something useful with their hands, assemble something and, and feel the joy of having put something together and made it work, go and have a look at the Elkie website, uh, buy Steph's kits, keep her in business because the more she can grow this, the more we're going to be able to encourage people to follow us and actually pick up some useful skills that will keep the sector running. I'd like to hear more from Steph in the future. Yeah. Look, I would love to have yes. Steph, I'm not bullying you right now, Steph, by the way, <laughs> um, but I'd love to have, um, have you do a workshop at a Technorama conference. I think that would be wonderful. Um, mm. Sort of dive more into the um, yep. Raspberry Pi and Arduino stuff. If you're, oh, yeah, I think that's yeah. I think that's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, it's I'll not be a, um, an Arduino workshop in January at the Brisbane Ooh. Hackerspace. Uh, we oh, receive okay. a kit to take home. Um, Great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely be hearing more from uh, you in the future for sure. And um, once again, thank you so much to everyone for all of your um, feedback and um, hard work tonight and ongoing. Um, <laughs> Thank you everyone so much. Uh, have a great night. Have a great holiday period. Um, I hope you get to relax and unwind a little from this crazy, crazy year. And uh, we'll be back in 2021 with a new fresh hot take on the uh, Technorama Tuesdays webinar series and supported by the CMTO. So for now, good night and uh, have a good one. See you later. Bye.